My name is Craig Myers, and I'm the sound designer and engineer for River City Rhythm Drum and Bugle Corps. I'm also a professional audiovisual technician and hope to walk you through the basics of incorporating electronics into your marching arts program. Let's get started. Let's start off by talking about what your sound system is at its core. It's essentially a source, generally a microphone or electronic instrument, a modifier like a mixer, audio processor or amplifier, and a destination, your speaker system. We'll begin with the source talking about microphones, synthesizers, and common rhythm section instruments. So to begin, a common question I get a lot is what type of microphone should I use? Uh, and the three questions I would ask you are, what are we miking? Is it a soloist or a marimba perhaps? Does that instrument need to be a wireless solution or can we just use a wired microphone? And then what your ensemble's budget is. Those are going to be the three main things that determine what solution is best for you. There are many types of wired microphones out there, but I'm going to focus on two types today. One is known as a cardioid microphone, like this Shure SM57. It's a durable and cheaper microphone and stands up to the rigors of marching band. We also have what's called a condenser microphone, like this Audio-Technica AT2035, which is more sensitive, captures more audio information, but is more expensive and more fragile as well. With wireless systems, there are three basic elements, a microphone, transmitter, and receiver. So it's like its own mini sound system in that it has a source, a modifier, and a destination. Wireless systems are significantly more expensive and more complex to operate successfully, so it should be a consideration before purchasing. So what are some of the pros and cons of a wireless system? Well, they're a great solution to many creative ideas. You can put soloists on props back field and really explore some great visual possibilities. However, they can get very expensive and it's difficult to operate them successfully and consistently. Having a great wireless setup requires extensive planning on what specific goals are set and sourcing the right solutions to help achieve them. These conversations definitely need to be happening during the design process and prior to putting pen to paper with your show. Some common issues with wireless systems include what's known as signal drop or a sudden loss of sound. Sometimes this can be attributed to what's known as body attenuation. Uh, our bodies are mostly made of liquid and mass and are really good at blocking RF signal. So here you see the transmitter has been placed on the performer's back in order to hide it from the audience. Really, that transmitter should be placed on their front side and maybe hidden by a jacket or their costume to ensure nothing is blocking the wireless signal. Another cause for signal drop is what's known as interference. You might have a wireless mic that works really well for you during all your regular season shows and then cuts out at state finals unexpectedly. And a lot of this is caused by being in large NFL stadiums and having large audiences and more cell phones in the room. There's just a lot of wireless signals bouncing around in those environments. The best way to prevent this is to use what's called frequency coordination. We'll go over that in a second. Some other considerations to keep in mind are if you want three or more wireless microphones at a time, it's recommended that you also purchase an antenna distribution system. Make sure there's always line of sight between the wireless receiver and the wireless transmitter. Basically, if your antenna's on your mixer cart, your audio engineer should be able to see the wireless pack with no other members or props blocking that signal. Another essential practice that we do in the pro audio field is what's called wireless frequency coordination. Basically, this means that all of our channels are clear and it's something you have to check every day and at every venue. Make sure that you're planning for the future before purchasing. Lower price systems are gonna have less room for expansion over the years uh, and having multiple wireless channels. Uh, higher price systems are easier to add microphones on as you go. So if you buy three your first year, uh, but eventually have the goal of going up to seven to nine microphones, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that system can meet your end goal. Lastly, a really important tool is what's known as a spectrum analyzer. This device scans the area you're in and helps you find open frequencies and is a really useful tool when you're at those big stadium shows. Let's move on to another type of source, the synthesizer. One type of synthesizer is what's known as a hardware synth, and this is a standalone unit, but there's also what's called a software synth, which combines generally a MIDI keyboard and a computer of some sort. 
I like this option because I use a program called MainStage. It's affordable, it's got tons of sounds, and it's a great way to organize your show in one file. If you are using your laptop as your synthesizer, just make sure we're not connecting it to the sound system with one of these. You'll wear out your headphone port, and there's more likely a chance for it to become unplugged accidentally. I definitely recommend using what's called a USB audio unit, just like this Focusrite Scarlett 2i2. Uh, it's a great way to turn your computer's audio into two physical outputs that you can then connect to your system. If you're integrating other standard rhythm section instruments like guitar or bass guitar, make sure you're connecting them using a direct box to your system. You could also use the direct out uh, at the back of their amplifier if they're using one. Lastly, make sure these students have a personal monitor, like a small powerful speaker that can be heard over the band, or in-ear monitors, which are a bit more expensive. Just know that regular headphones will not fit the bill. So again, the three main areas of our sound system are the source, the modifier, and the destination. Let's focus on the modifier, which includes mixers, audio processors, and amplifiers. Let's start with a mixer. It's tough to know how to even get started with these things, but I'll show you some basic steps you can take to get things up and running. All right, mixers can be pretty intimidating to look at right away with all their knobs, buttons, and faders. But if you follow the arrows, this is the path that sound travels through the mixer. It's basically one giant U. And luckily that outlines the path we're gonna take as we do a simple setup today. So where do we start? Well, of course you have to plug everything in first and that starts at the top. Then I quick jump down, make sure that all my channels are on or unmuted. Then I set all my faders to zero or unity. This allows me to hear the raw sound of the channel. And of course, don't forget the master fader as well. Next on our path is the gain adjustment. This knob controls the volume input of the channel. Slowly turn up while a student is playing to your desired taste. Make sure that the channel isn't peaking by watching your volume meters. From there, you can make adjustments to your EQ or aux sense, but for today, we're gonna keep it simple and adjust pan. Pan adjusts how much of the channel signal comes out of the left or right speaker. This is a great tool to make sure that the sound coming out of your speakers mimics the sound as if you're standing right in front of the ensemble. Once these basics are set on each channel, then you can adjust the faders while the entire ensemble plays to get the right mix. Don't forget to use your volume meter to help fine tune. Other common modifiers are audio processing tools like delay or reverb, and these can really add some cool effects to your sonic palette. And generally the last modifier your sound will go through is an amplifier, which gets it powered up to be sent to the speakers. The last stop on our journey through the sound system is the destination, also known as the speaker system. The typical speaker system used in the marching arts consists of two main cabinets equally spaced from the 50 yard line and one to two subwoofers for bass frequencies. They can either be active or passive. An active speaker is an all-in-one solution the amplifier and speaker cones are all built into the cabinet. A passive speaker requires a separate amplifier. The cabinet only contains the speaker. However, there's less cabling involved, so the setup can be easier. We want as much of the audience to hear our electronics as possible, so proper speaker alignment and aiming are important. You may have seen this solution, which is not ideal. Most of the coverage of the speaker is being aimed far above the audience members. Orient the speaker for optimal coverage according to your specs. For example, this means that the speaker has 90 degrees of horizontal coverage and 60 degrees of vertical coverage. A speaker cart that can be adjusted is ideal as you can customize your speaker's angle from venue to venue. Another common question I get a lot is how to prevent feedback. And I'm sure we've all heard that annoying screeching sound that comes when a microphone and a speaker get locked into an audio loop. Some steps you can take to prevent feedback uh, is to ensure the speakers are in place in front of the ensemble and any microphones on the field. Make sure that the gain is set appropriately and not too cranked. A common practice in the pro audio world is what's known as ringing out the system. And this involves uh, adjusting the main output graphic equalizer settings. You're gonna wanna ask an audio engineer for help with this. Just remember at the end of the day, it does happen to the pros as well. Some troubleshooting tips, Identify the problem channel via volume meters or peak limit indicators. Either mute the system or pull the master fader down immediately to stop the loop. 
Then you can gradually pull your master fader back up and pay careful attention for any signs that a feedback loop is starting again. Some final tips I'll leave you with are to make sure that you sound check before each rehearsal and show. A quick snap near the mic is all that's needed. You now know the path sound takes as it travels through a sound system or its signal flow. If a channel isn't working or you're not getting any sound, start at the source and check every connection and element in the signal flow to find the problem. If setting up your system and tearing down at a show feels frantic and uncertain, you can make system maps to help others navigate your setup and take time in rehearsal to define a consistent setup teardown process. Some essential tools I'd recommend are a cable tester, which comes in very handy. An audio snake helps with organization and minimizing cables. Velcro cable ties are a great way to wrangle your cables. And using multicolor electrical tape can help label your cables and make things easy and organized. We hope this video has been helpful. If you have any questions, contact info at rivercityrhythm.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on down the road.